Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the marketplace. Coming up, Ghana's external debt to GDP ranked sixth highest in West Africa, but is the only equus country in debt distress. We'll tell you more from an AFDB report. Also coming up, managers of some companies arrested for data breaches granted bail but expected to report to the CID today. And prices of LPG go up, but by how much? We'll speak with the LPG Marketers Association on, on that as well as concerns about the implementation of the cylinder recirculation model, which is set to be implemented next month. My name is Daryl Kwa. Thanks for being with us. Details coming up. And first up, Ghana's external debt relative to the size of the economy of about 39.5% in 2022 ranked at the sixth highest in West Africa. According to the African Development Bank 2023 West Africa Economic Outlook Report, Ghana's external debt of gross domestic product was higher than the West African average of 29.6%. Here's more. At the end of December 2022, Ghana's external debt stood at $29 billion. But among the 16 ECOWAS countries, the nation is the only one that is in debt distress. It is therefore surprising because countries such as Cape Verde, Senegal and Niger, which have high external debt relative to the size of the economies, are not in distress. According to the African Development Bank, external debt accumulation was facilitated by a rise in the issuance of euro bonds. This suggested that exchange rate depreciation as well as the current normalization of monetary policy across the world were important risk for these countries. It added that the key drivers of external debt dynamics in West Africa were the rapid exchange rate depreciation, especially in commodity exporting countries, as well as high primary fiscal deficits and weak economic growth caused by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Therefore, Ghana's economic challenges may not be only due to the high debt burden, but rather a myriad of issues. And joining us on uh, Zoom to discuss the senior finance lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, uh, Siriam Kawo. Good afternoon to you. And so, uh, sixth highest uh, in Af West Africa when ranking external debt relative to the size of the economy, and the only country in West Africa that is debt distressed. What does this say about Ghana's debt crisis? Good afternoon, Darren. Um, it, it tells us that there is a lot of more, a lot of work for us to do as a country. We have touted ourselves as the gateway to Africa, and one of the countries with uh, good policies and implementations. But being six in Africa, in terms of debt to GDP ratio and having the average of more than 29.5% of that of West Africa um, tells us that there is a lot of work for our political leaders to do in terms of raising revenue, the use of uh, our natural resources to the benefit of Ghanaians. If we have Niger that have a coup cool and their debt to GDP is better than that of us, Ghana, uh, it's, it's a sad story that our leaders need to sit down, we need to re-strategize and ensure that the resources that we have at our disposal and any amount of money that we try to borrow, we use it to the benefit of the Ghanaian population. And uh, explain to us how um, other countries such as Cape Verde, Senegal, you mentioned Niger, which have high external debts uh, relative to the size of their economies, are not in the debt distress threshold, but Ghana is. Yeah, so they, they, they try, those countries are trying to control government expenditure, the fiscal controls are there. They, they try to avoid the accumulation of more debt. They try to diversify. They're not trying to 
uh, have dependence on single sector economy, such as gold or oil. They are trying to look at all the other areas of our account, their country. If you look at Niger, they, they, look, they are not only looking at lithium, which gives them a lot of uh, export uh, income, but then they are looking at agriculture and diversification into the other areas. They promote a lot of exports, and they try to negotiate better when it comes to debt. The interest rates that these countries uh, pay on their debt is much lower than that of Ghana. And they, they put in the measures in terms of debt restructuring when there is an issue, and they try to collect more taxes from their own citizens. They, these countries have a lot of foreign grants that go to them. And if you look at it, uh, for example, Niger, you, you look at Russia going in, France going in, U.S. having a, a, a better deal with them and all those things. So these things help out a lot. Then they have uh, investment in productive sectors of the economy. The, Niger gives us onions and some other items. And so when they have those crises and the borders have been closed, we have a lot of issues in our country where prices will have to go up. They invest sometimes in infrastructure, though uh, their electricity is not too okay, but they invest in infrastructure and the people see that this investment in infrastructure are also uh, benefiting them. Mm. And the government has made so many excuses for borrowing, uh, whereas the other West African countries who are faced with the same challenges, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, Russia's war against Ukraine, seem to have fairly handled the impact and not attain a debt distress status. So again, um, government can make up those excuses, can they still? No. Government has no duty to make excuses for uh, for us, uh, for them plunging us into debt distress. Um, we have not enhanced our corporate governance systems. There's no transparency and accountability that will ensure that monies that are borrowed are properly used efficiently and effectively in our country. And so uh, we also do not mobilize enough domestic revenue in order to augment the borrowings that we have done. We fail to promote our tourism sector. Now we are now talking about it. A lot of the monies have been spent recklessly, excuse my language. They have spent the monies recklessly without accounting for it. There is no value for the money. Government contracts in Ghana are overpriced. And once they are overpriced, we, we, we realize that uh, the money that we borrow, we have to uh, go back and pay for them. We, we go in for uh, dollar-denominated loans, so when the, uh, f the currency depreciates, our currency will all, the, the loans or the debts that we have will also have to go up. Mm. It is high time, if these countries are doing it and they are not facing crisis, Ghana as a country must also look at that. And once we are not doing it, we have no justification whatsoever we want to talk about. For example, why would governments sublet the collection of revenue to another company? Quite recently, we heard that uh, revenue mobilizers or collectors have been paid 2 point something billion, uh, million Ghana cities when the amount that they have realized is less than that which they have collected. That is, uh, that is a serious issue that we need to look mm. at. We are not promoting our export. We are not promoting the consumption of locally, uh, cons uh, locally produced products in our country. We are not enhancing the production of agriculture where we help the farmers in order to, for them to make commercial farming and do the kind of industrialization that we want to do. So we, we hold workshops, we talk about issues, but we do not, unfortunately, implement them. Well, according to the African Development Bank report, external debt accumulation was facilitated by a rise in the issuance of euro bonds. It also suggested that the action rates of depreciation as well as the current normalization of monetary policy across the world were important risks. So how do we manage these risks going forward? 
Yeah, so uh, it, is, it is time, for example, Ghana has been cut off the, from the international financial market where we cannot go and raise euro bonds again. And so the only source of revenue for us is from grants and also from raising revenue from the domestic market through the treasury bill. Uh, it is high time for us to now prioritize it will, a situation where we, as a country, we borrow to pay debt. So every year we borrow about 3 billion Ghana cities to pay our uh, debt over time. When the revenue from within cannot pay this debt, mm. these are issues that we need to avoid immediately. And we need to take steps to ensure that we get the needed revenue. The issue of collateralization of the debt, where we borrow against future earnings, must stop. Because if we collateralize the debt and take the money and we don't invest it in productive ventures, that will give us the returns that we need. At the end of the day, the country will go back to borrow. And once we borrow to pay the debt that we owe, we are going to be uh, it perpetually indebted to those countries. And when you go to borrow, it invariably increases your rate of borrowing and the cost of doing business with these countries. And we need to also make sure that we put our country, Ghana, first so that we get value for money. We invest in productive ventures. We mm. draw, we think about transparency, uh, efficiency, and effectiveness in the governance of our country. We reduce corruption, which the special prosecutor, one way or the other, is trying to champion that particular cause now. As to how far he will go is another story we need to discuss. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah Mukawa, Senior Finance Lecturer at the University of Cape Coast. Uh, Thank you, Gary. I appreciate Thank your time with us. Enjoy the rest of the day. Well, turning to other stories, managers of various companies who were arrested Monday for failing to comply with the country's data protection laws have been granted bail and are expected to report to the Police Criminal Investigation Department today. The enforcement exercise by the Data Protection Commission is to deter other data controllers who are breaching uh, the law. But there could be a way out for data controllers who are yet to be picked up by the Commission. I'm joined by uh, Sylvia Pia, who is Chief Executive Officer of Information Governance Solutions, also a data protection expert. Good afternoon to you. Uh, before we talk about the way out, tell us how important data protection is for a country like ours. Very good afternoon to listeners and everybody. Uh, data protection has been um, evolving since the, the after the World War when um, human rights became an issue. So obviously the Human Rights Act was passed and has led to uh, a number of uh, laws and conventions. Data protection, it's a law that is there to protect you and I as a living individual. And therefore, uh, it, is, it cannot be overstressed that our information, I mean, any business or any uh, economy or any country cannot exist without citizens or individuals. And therefore, the information about art is important to do business. Every, every organization needs information about customers, about clients, members, patients in the hospital. And therefore, the information we give to organization is paramount, it's central to what we do. So protecting data protection is very important because that is how it can protect the information that the individuals choose to share with us. And so it cannot be less than to say that we must, we must protect data protection. Uh, you cannot do business these days across the globe without um, exercising or complying to data protection laws and regulations. Oh, tell us a bit more about how uh, companies uh, benefit from data protection. Okay, the I always use the word return on investment in, in ensuring you comply with data protection in any industry uh, um, you operate. I think I've just established how important it is to use uh, in people's information. And so for a company, the benefit of that is it instills trust into the customers or your, your clients that you take uh, their information seriously and indeed you value their information. So companies, uh, um, have to invest time, 
and, and resources to make sure they comply. Now, these days, you can't even uh, go for a tender or operate globally without complying with re uh, relevant data protection laws. And so, for, for any organization, regardless of what where you are operating, you cannot operate uh, very soon without uh, compliant data protection. So, it comes uh, one of the top five risks or, or issues that has to be di di discussed or addressed in any company's uh, operation. So, for any organization, you cannot actually operate. Very soon, you cannot operate. Even employees' information comes, to, uh, uh, comes in scope when we are talking about information about individuals. So, every, every organization needs uh, people's information. Therefore, data protection is all to what you can do. And so we've seen that the Data uh, Protection Commission this week has carried out an enforcement exercise uh, to uh, apprehend uh, data controllers who are breaching the laws. And as we have been reporting today, uh, those, some of those who are arrested have been granted bail. Others are supposed to, uh, they are supposed to report to the CID today. Uh, but for those who are yet to be, who are yet to be picked up, uh, the non-compliant data controllers, is there a way out for them? Do they still have a chance yes. to make it right? Yes, there is a chance. I think the first thing you have to do is to make sure you, you, you start the journey. Compliance is a journey, and therefore data protection compliance is a journey. The first thing you need to do is to register. And this is something information governance solutions we can do. We can help you register for free, and we can hold your hand on the compliance journey. Registering is just the first step of, of telling the commission, of telling any regulator that, you are aware that you can't post information and you are committed to ensuring that your data will be processed securely and in a manner appropriate to what they gave the information uh, to you for. I have already said how important it is for us to use people's information. No, no, no business can exist without people's uh, data. And therefore, uh, for controllers, I will urge all of them to contact us. Or, or reach out and register with the commission um, and start the journey of compliance. So where we come in is to help you. Once you've registered, we can then hold your hand on the entire compliance journey uh, um, in, in, in your business life cycle. And one of the things uh, companies now have to think about is um, accessing skilled data protection professionals. How can they do so? Data protection professionals um, globally is a shortage. And so uh, what we are doing in Ghana in conjunction with the commission is that we offer what we call the certified data protection supervisor. And this is a person that every organization must appoint to lead and advise the organization on their compliance journey. And so we offer the practitioner training uh, to organizations. Um, this is a, a course that has been certified by the Data Protection Commission. We are an accredited organization by them which means they have tested us, they've assessed that and they know we have the resources, the expertise, the knowledge and the, and, and the tools to hold the hand of data controllers to do this. So all organizations, we will, I mean, as I'm speaking now, we are delivering uh, practitioner training this week. So what I've added is to either go to our site, which is www.infogovgh.com uh, to, to register or, or to book an appointment to talk to one of our uh, uh, consultants uh, uh, to start the journey of compliance, or indeed reach out to the commission and find out how you can attend one of these courses, or what how you can appoint a data protection supervisors. Uh, small organizations that um, may not necessarily be in a position or have the capacity to train individuals to to become equipped to uh, deliver data protection training, we offer something called the data protection supervisor where we will hold their hand or will become their nominated data protection practitioner um, and, and on, the, on the compliance journey that I've mentioned briefly about. So there is help out there, and that is where, where information governance comes in. All right, very important. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia Pia, Chief Executive Officer, Information Governance Solutions, also a data protection expert. Let's turn to LPG now. Prices of petroleum prices went up yesterday at the pumps across the country. Um, aside from diesel and petrol, one important product that also saw uh, price increases, LPG. Let's get on to Zoom, speak with uh, Gabriel Kumi, who is Vice President of the LPG Marketers Association, to understand the 
uh, price increases and what has influenced this latest um, upward adjustment. Good afternoon to you. So uh, we have witnessed a substantial increase in the prices of petrol and diesel. What is the situation with LPG? Uh, good afternoon, Daryl. Good afternoon to our viewers. Uh, the price of um, I guess the LPG saw the highest increase, but uh, LPG price has gone up between 15 and 20 percent this winter, compared to diesel and uh, diesel and petrol, which went up uh, about 7 8 percent. And the main reason attributed to this is, is the fact that the, the price of finished product on the international market of LPG had gone up by about 80 percent, and unfortunately, crude oil also saw a marginal increase in the price of. Uh, over the past uh, two weeks. Uh, the city was able to gain some ground over the past two weeks, but unfortunately, uh, the ground that the city gained was not enough to offset the increase in the price uh, that we are witnessing in the international market. That is why LPG has gone up that much. Uh, what is the outlook um, after two weeks? What do you anticipate the market would look like? Is um, already uh, the price of this product in the national market of, of, of LPG has already shot up by uh, some some five percent, uh, which which means that uh, barring any uh, positive uh, outlook, the the next window, which begins at the end of uh, this month on the first of September, we are likely to see another increment in the price of LPG, mm. and, and and that is that is quite. Uh, bad for consumers, unfortunately. Very bad for consumers, um, that's true. And all this happening as uh, we gear up for the implementation of the cylinder recirculation uh, program next month. I know that the LPG marketers have raised some concerns and you wrote to the MP about it. Um, have you received any response? Uh, yes, indeed. We have we had some serious concerns. And I think um, Joy News even was able to have a copy of our letter, and we have some very, very genuine concerns. Um, we wrote to MPA, they've also responded, um, uh, trying to address our concerns, but we believe their response is not uh, addressed, does not address our concerns properly. So we are also uh, sending a response to them. Hopefully by next week, we should be able to meet up with them. And, and, and try and thrash out some of these things. I mean, one area that we are glad that the NPA has acceded to the fact that we are going to implement the two systems side by side uh, because we believe that the smartest uh, move, that's the smartest way to go because you can't just shut up, shut down uh, a model that we have operated over the past 30 years and introduce a new one. Uh, the smartest thing to do is to uh, keep the old one and try and implement the, the, the new one gradually along. And that MPA has accepted. What what we are yet to agree is the number of years that these two systems are going to run side by side. So we gradually uh, 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 fade out the, 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 the old one. What we also uh, will have to agree with MPA is the fact that the existing outlets should, should be allowed to run its two systems at at, 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 that, at, 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 at the outlet, so that we can gradually transition our consumers. Because one very important group that is very key to this transition is the consumer. So you, you really need to uh, work on the consumer to transition him from the system that he has known for, for, for 30 years onto the new system that is coming. Uh, so in principle, you are not um, against the program, you just want the right structures to be put in place? Uh, we have never stood against government policy. We have always believed that government can only govern through the implementation of policies and programs. But the details of the implementation is what, what, what we've always fought against. Um, this is, this is, uh, the current system is a system we've been operating for the past 30 years. And this is so entrenched that it makes sense that if you are introducing a new one, you go at it slowly, so you don't disorient the consumer, so you don't create any system for the, any shortage for the consumer in, 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 in your attempt to introduce the new one. And we have we have been at the table with them, and we believe at the end of the day, a good reason will prevail, and then we can all transition over a certain period. Uh, but what we've always also said is that 
Uh, we don't think Ghana is ready. We don't think we have prepared the, the minds of industry and the minds of the consumer enough to be able to begin this transition. So MPA starting date of next month, uh, we believe is, 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 is much too soon. Course. Thank you so much, Gabriel Kumi, Vice President, LPD Marketers Association. Grateful for your time. Well, our final story uh, this afternoon. Commercial banks are making a strong case for the operationalization of the much-talked-about financial stability fund to sustain the operations. This was captured in the Ghana Association of Banks report on the media budget review. Here's more in this report. Ghana Association of Banks believes that the stability fund, together with planned recapitalization of banks in the country, will ensure stability as well as strengthen financial intimidation to support the private sector. Government is currently waiting for some financial support from the World Bank and other donors so that the fund can take off in September this year. The Financial Stability Fund, according to government, is expected to support banks and financial institutions in the country that were badly hit by the domestic debt exchange program. The banks are also pushing for shareholder investments now to help restore capital buffers in the long term. A return to profit position by most of the commercial banks for the first half of this year, the Ghana Association of Banks believes that this can be partly linked to introduction of temporary regulatory reliefs by the Bank of Ghana. They also believe that a lot more still needs to be done to help restore public confidence in the banking industry as well as the broader financial system. And that's our program, everyone. Thanks for watching. More news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Our top story is there. Fuel prices shoot up. Uh, petrol now selling at 13 cities, 50 per Swiss. Diesel, 13 cities, 90 per Swiss per liter. Also, uh, prices of petrol and diesel to increase averagely by about 5.7% according to COPEC. And we see that happening. Uh, you can read more about that on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business. My name is Daryl Kyle. Thanks for watching. We will be back same time tomorrow.